Hello history lovers and welcome back to my channel. My name is Hannah and funnily enough I talk about history. If you are new here make sure you hit that subscribe button and turn on the notification bell so you never miss a video. And let's continue our deep dive into the life of Queen Anne Boleyn. We are on part five of this series. Oh my god guys I was not expecting this to be this long. So if you've missed out on the earlier parts, please make sure you go check them out. At this point, Anne is ultimately queen in all but title. And in autumn 1532, Anne and Henry were in the midst of planning a trip to France. However, there was a significant hurdle to overcome. Finding a royal lady willing to officially receive Anne. Queen Eleanor, sister of Charles V, declined the request. Henry, however, wasn't particularly keen on Eleanor receiving Anne, so there was no love lost there. Additionally, Francis' sister Marguerite, who was now the Queen of Navarre, whom Anne had known and admired during her time in France, also refused to have any involvement with Anne due to her association with the religious reformation. Without a royal lady to receive her legally, Anne could not make the trip to France. But on the other hand, it wasn't considered safe for her to remain alone in England. As a result, Anne stayed in the English-controlled territory of Calais while Henry journeyed to the French-controlled region of France. They departed for Dover on the 10th of October. On the 11th of October 1532, just before dawn, Anne Boleyn sailed on the Swallow, along with her sister and the king. After spending the third night of their journey, at Dover Castle. The weather was favourable and their voyage to France was smooth. At 10 o'clock in the morning they arrived at Calais where they were greeted with a resounding royal salute. Henry and Anne then went to hear mass at the Church of St Nicholas. When they were finished they retired to their lodgings at the Exchequer. The royal couple stayed there until the 21st of October when Henry left Anne to meet Francis. On the 25th of October 1532, Kings Henry and Francis departed Boulogne, where Henry had been a guest at the French court, and they returned to Calais. Curiously, it seems that Anne and her ladies were absent from the elaborate welcome home ceremonies. This, however, did not stop Francis from sending Anne a diamond as a gift through the Provost of Paris. I definitely said that wrong. The King of France was lodged at the Staple Inn, situated on the main square of Calais, a distance away from the Exchequer Palace. On the 29th of October 1532, Henry accompanied Francois to the French border for their farewell. Due to the violent storms in the Channel, the English court remained at the Exchequer for an additional two weeks, affording Henry and Anne the opportunity to enjoy what was essentially their honeymoon. However, this idyllic period concluded at midnight on the 12th of November, when favourable winds enabled the king to sail back to England. Their journey took 29 hours. In 1532, Anne had already established herself as the king's first lady. Despite Henry's existing marriage, during Christmas of that year, Anne discovered that she was pregnant. Meanwhile, Catherine spent Christmas of 1532 in relative isolation at Enfield. Cromwell's spies closely monitored her, and she was prohibited from communicating with Chapuis, although she attempted to do so whenever possible. On the 25th of January 1533, upon learning of Anne's pregnancy, Henry secretly married her in a turret room at York Place. The witnesses to this secret union included Anne's parents, her brother, Lord Rochford, and two individuals described as favourites. It has been suggested that Mary Boleyn might have been one of these witnesses, but if that was the case, she would likely have been listed among the family members rather than just as a favourite. Contemporary sources do not convey the impression that she held a favoured position with Anne and the King. While it's possible that Anne would have had her sister, and perhaps her sister-in-law as attendants, there were others whom she was closer to. The favourites could have ever been gentlemen of the King's Privy Chamber, such as Sir Henry Norris, Sir Nicholas Carew, or Sir Francis Bryan. 
on the 12th of April 1533, Anne made her first public appearance as the Queen of England. Henry took the opportunity to flaunt his beautiful young and more importantly pregnant wife and queen to the entire court. She was clad in cloth of gold and loaded with the richest jewels. Anne was accompanied by 60 maids of honour and ceremonially led to mass. The long train of her gown was carried by Mary Howard. Anne's household consisted of 200 individuals. Her sister Mary Boleyn was among her ladies-in-waiting. Her ladies-in-waiting also included her sister-in-law Jane Boleyn, Lady Rochford, Lady Margaret Douglas, the King's niece, Lady Mary Howard, Anne's cousin, the daughter of the Duke of Norfolk and was also the wife of Henry Fitzroy, Francis de Vere, who was also married to another cousin, Norfolk's son, Henry Howard, Earl of Surrey, Mary Shelton, yet another cousin, but on the Boleyn side, Elizabeth Wood, wife of Sir James Boleyn, Anne Savage, Lady Berkeley, and Elizabeth Brown, Countess of Worcester, whose testimony would help towards Anne's downfall. Other notable names included Anne Saville, Anne Gainsford, Lady Zouch, Elizabeth Holland, the mistress of the Duke of Norfolk, and one of Anne's maids of honour was Jane Seymour and her future replacement as Queen. Seymour, like some of the other 200 people in Anne's service, had probably served Catherine of Aragon prior. We say prior because we can neither confirm nor deny whether Jane actually did work for Catherine. Anne had high expectations for her ladies. She gave them each a little book of prayers and psalms to hang at their girdles. She kept them busy sewing clothing for the less fortunate for hours on end. They were required to attend Mass daily and display a virtuous demeanour. Anne's silk woman later claimed that she had never seen better order amongst the ladies and gentlewomen of the court than in Anne Boleyn's day. On the 23rd of May 1533, Archbishop Cranmer declared that the marriage between King Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon was invalid and unlawful and declared days later that Henry's marriage to Anne Boleyn was good and valid. When the Princess Mary received the news of the Privy Council and Cranmer's decision in May, which declared Anne as Queen, she staunchly refused to accept anyone but her mother as the rightful Queen. Her defiance not only fueled Anne's growing resentment, but also created a deep rift between Mary and her father. Anne tried to get Mary to acknowledge her as Queen and even offered Mary an invite to court, and promising reconciliation with her father if Mary acknowledged Anne as Queen. Mary's response was curt. No! What did she say? <laughs> Just talking sh She replied that she knew no Queen of England except her mother. However, she added that if Madame Boleyn were to intercede with the King on her behalf, then she would greatly appreciate it. Also at this time, Anne's pregnancy was public knowledge. She complained about losing her figure, but her father told her that she should thank God she found herself in such a condition. True. 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 On the 29th of May 1533, the celebrations for Anne's coronation commenced with a spectacular river pageant. At 3pm, royally garbed in cloth of gold, the new queen embarked on a barge that was originally used by Catherine of Aragon. The journey began at Greenwich Palace, where Anne and her entourage, including Mary and the other ladies, accompanied by their father and numerous noblemen, set sail along the River Thames. Their destination was the Tower of London, where tradition dictated that she would reside before her official coronation. As Anne disembarked at the Tower, she was greeted with joyful countenance by the King, and the cannon on the Tower Wharf was fired in salute. On the 1st of June 1533, Anne Boleyn's momentous coronation took place at Westminster Abbey during her coronation. Anne was heavily pregnant, and as we know, bladder control is not at its strongest when you've got another human being pressing on it. So, as a result, Anne's ladies-in-waiting kept a potty nearby under a table. I mean, when you gotta go, you gotta go. For her coronation day, Anne wore a crimson velvet gown lined with ermine, beneath a purple velvet mantle. She was received by the clergy at Westminster Hall and escorted to the Abbey, where she was followed by several noblewomen, some on palfreys and others in chariots. Mary and the rest of the Queen's ladies, all wearing red robes and gowns, trailed behind her. Anne was crowned with St Edward's crown, and she held a sceptre of gold in her right hand, 
and a rod of ivory in her left. No other queen consort before or since has been crowned in this way. Henry was making a really big show and he was effectively crowning Anne as a queen regnant just to really get the point across that Anne is the rightful queen, not Catherine. After the crowning ceremony, these ladies accompanied Anne back to Westminster Hall for the solemn feast that followed. 1533 was also the year that Parliament passed an act that allowed marriage with the sister of a former mistress. However, what this act failed to do was to stop the rumours from circulating about Henry and Mary Boleyn's affair. In that same year, several individuals were arrested for accusing the king of marrying the sister of his former mistress. In June 1533, not so long after the coronation, Anne and Henry sought respite at Hampton Court Palace. Reports indicated that Anne was in good health and high spirits, and in August, one month before Anne was due to give birth, she caught Henry cheating. Not a great plan. Anne, quite rightly, fuming, confronted Henry about it, and he responded that she should not look and endure as more worthy persons. She ought to know that it was in his power to humble her again in a moment. On the 7th of September 1533, Queen Anne Boleyn finally gives birth to a healthy baby girl at Greenwich Palace. The new princess was named Elizabeth after her paternal grandmother, Queen Elizabeth of York, and potentially after Anne's own mother, Elizabeth Howard. Let's be honest, the birth of the princess was a disappointment, but Henry did comfort Anne, saying, you and I are both young, and by God's grace, the boys will follow. It's worth pointing out here that for he and Catherine, it took several tries before they had a baby that was born healthy. Henry, Duke of Cornwall, died within a few weeks, and out of her six pregnancies, only Mary survived. Whereas with Anne, she got pregnant quickly, and the first child she has survives. So you can see why Henry was optimistic. The Princess Elizabeth had a splendid christening in the Church of the Observant Friars at Greenwich Palace three days later, on the 10th of September. Neither Henry or Anne attended Elizabeth's christening. Her godparents, Archbishop Cranmer, Dowager Duchess of Norfolk, Dowager Marchioness of Dorset, and the Marquess of Exeter were there in their place. The Boleyns and Howards were out in full force. The Dowager Duchess of Norfolk helped carry the canopy of estate along with George Boleyn, Lord Rochford. Elizabeth was wrapped in a mantle of purple velvet, with a long train that was supported by her grandfather, Thomas Boleyn. Mary Howard, daughter of the Duke of Norfolk, carried a chrism of pearl and stone to put on the child at baptism. The only Boleyn not confirmed to have a role was the princess's aunt, Mary Boleyn, who was probably one of the many ladies and gentlemen who followed in the procession. But I think it's worth pointing out that the sister of the Queen didn't have a prominent role at either the coronation nor the christening, and this may give us a good insight into the sisters' relationship. The procession, which had over 500 torchbearers, returns the Princess Elizabeth to the Queen's apartments, where Anne, robed and lying on her great French bed with the King at her side, received her daughter joyfully and offered the guests more refreshments. The French ambassador noted that the whole occasion was so perfect that nothing was lacking. And this is where I'm going to leave today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already. And if you really liked this video, then why not leave a super thanks? But until the next one, have a wonderful day.